All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our um, fourth in the series of our history, um, history author talks. Uh, today, we are honored to have Nathaniel Philbrick with us. So Nathaniel was born in Boston, Massachusetts, grew up in Pittsburgh, the BA in English from uh, Brown University and an MA in American Literature from Duke, where he was a James B. Duke Fellow. He was also Brown University's first intercollegiate All-American Sailor in 1978. 1986, uh, he moved to Nantucket with his wife, Melissa, and their two children. And in 94, he published his first book about the island, Away Offshore, followed in 98 by a study of Nantucket's uh, Native American legacy in Abram's eyes. Uh, he was a founding director of the Nantucket Egan Maritime Institute and is a research fellow at the Nantucket Historical Association. In 2000, Nathaniel published the New York Times bestseller in the Heart of the Sea, which won the American or the National Book Award for nonfiction. And it was the basis of the 2015 movie of the same name directed by Ron Howard. 2018, he published New York Times bestseller in the Hurricane's Eye, the genius of George Washington and the victory at Yorktown, which was a finalist for the George Washington Book Prize and the winner of the Commodore John Berry Book Award for American Maritime Literature. His latest New York Times bestseller in the book we're discussing today, Travels with George, In Search of Washington and His Legacy, was published in September of 2021. Nat has appeared on The Today Show, The Morning Show, Dateline, PBS's American Experience, C-SPAN, and NPR, and today we are honored to have him with us for our History Author Talks series. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Nathaniel Philbrick. Well, it's great and an honor to be with all of you. Um, I, I, uh, I came to Travels with George uh, as I was finishing up my third book about the American Revolution in the Hurricane's Eye, about the year of Yorktown, with a special focus on the naval battle fought between the British and French that made possible that great victory. And, you know, I had spent the last 25 years holed up in my office, which you see right now and in, in my basement on Nantucket Island, and uh, either uh, in the office or in the archives, and I was getting itchy. I, I just needed a change of some sort. And it was during a, a late inning research trip to Providence, Rhode Island, that I uh, entered the John Brown House. And this is not John Brown, the abolitionist. This is John Brown, one of the co-founders of Brown University. And in this uh, great big brick uh, building uh, in the back, is a uh, what's known as John Brown's chariot, and uh, it's tiny. Um, in in uh, the book of J Travels with George, I compare the the fo single forward facing seat to the back seat of a VW Bug <laughs> mounted on four skinny wheels. And according to tradition, uh, in 1790, John Brown uh, took George Washington on a trip in his chariot out to Fox Point uh, shipyard, where he was building a ship. Uh, named in honor of the president. And uh, this would have meant that Washington was the newly inaugurated president. And it got me to thinking, what was Washington uh, now president doing visiting uh, Providence, Rhode Island? And I, I quickly began to realize that there was a whole chapter to Washington's life as president that I re was really unaware of, uh, that uh, when he became president, uh, on April 30th, 1789, when he was inaugurated at, at the temporary capital of New York, America was already a divided nation. Uh, the, the Constitution had deeply divided the country between, there were no political parties at this point, but between what were known as the Federalists, those who supported the Constitution and the strong national government it created, and the Anti-Federalists, uh, who distrusted uh, the very power of that central government, fearing it was a, another version of the monarchy uh, that they had just rebelled against. And so, uh, and in fact, uh, two states, Rhode Island and uh, North Carolina, had not ratified the Constitution by the time Washington was sworn in as president. There was a deep divide in the country. And on top of that, there were regional differences. Uh, there, uh, the governor of uh, Virginia, when he said, my country, he did not mean the United States of America. He meant Virginia. And this was true in just about all 13 former colonies. Washington needed to do something to create a sense of nationhood in what was still a very new nation. Now, this was before mass media, before you could get on the TV and 
and reach out to the American people. He needed to go out there and see them uh, firsthand. And so he uh, embarked just six months uh, into his uh, presidency on the first of a series of road trips across the country in which he would um, uh, visit all 13 states uh, uh, and, and in an attempt to create a sense of nationhood. The first one was the New England tour which did not include Rhode Island because it had not yet ratified the constitution. But uh, he would visit 60 towns, uh, it would be a month. Uh, this was in October and November while uh, Congress was in recess. And he would um, uh, uh, was be, be very successful in creating that sense of national identity. Uh, uh, and Washington, remember Washington, after eight years as, as general, uh, had developed an ability to make an impression. Uh, he was not a backslapper by any means, not an outgoing type of person, but he had a wonderful sense of the dramatic. Uh, he loved to attend plays and very uh, quickly on in his New England tour, he developed a kind of routine. Before, uh, Remember, he was not traveling in Air Force One, uh, he was traveling in a horse-drawn carriage uh, with, a, with what he called his retinue of not more than uh, a half a dozen people. I mean, no security detail. Two of um, the, uh, the, the people in his, in his entourage were in his enslaved uh, servants, Giles and Paris. And uh, bef before he would enter a town, Washington would step out of his carriage, dressed in his general's outfit, mount his great big white horse and ride down main thoroughfare to thunderous applause. Now this indeed made a tremendous impression. You know, today when we go to a um, political rally and, and hear the rock music and see the, the huge uh, uh, screens, uh, I think we are seeing a 21st, manifest 21st century manifestation of what Washington created first started when he rode down Main Street of so many small towns in Connecticut and uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, uh, dressed as a major general. Uh, you know, there, uh, but it was a fine line. Washington was trying to create this impression, the sense of pride in the new country, but he also didn't want people to think that he was another uh, <clears throat> George III. And so he made, um, uh, uh, at the very beginning, he made it known that uh, as a matter of policy, he was not going to be staying in private homes. He was not gonna be choosing any favorites during this tour. He's gonna to be staying only in public taverns. Now today, I think, uh, you know, we think of a, a historic house, you know, a B&B &B as a place, um, you know, a beautifully appointed home where you have, enjoy waffles uh, in the morning. Uh, the the Ta public taverns of the late 18th century weren't anything uh, but the B&Bs of our, our time. These were the roadside motels of the late 18th century. It's a very good thing that Washington, uh, there was no trip advisor in the late 18th century because when you read Washington's diary, it is one long lament, food terrible, beds worse. I mean, you know, Washington uh, was not necessarily enjoying this aspect of, of his journey, but it was something that he needed to do to prove to the American people that he was one of them, that he was um, uh, a man of the people. He was a leader of a republic. He was not a monarch. He was not a dictator. Uh, he was um, a, a, uh, elected by the people and would remain one of the people in his elected office. The longest uh, uh, most ambitious uh, tours uh, he would take would be the Southern tour. And remember, we think of Washington as a Southerner, uh, but uh, he actually knew uh, the Middle Atlantic and New England states much better than he knew the South. Uh, he had grown up in Virginia, but had barely spent any time in North Carolina, never been to South Carolina, never been to Georgia. And so the Southern tour um, was, uh, uh, would take him three months uh, more than 1,800 miles, if the conditions had been terrible uh, uh, in New England and the roads had been horrible, they were much worse in the South. And, uh, and so this was, uh, and this was also a couple of years into his administration, that honeymoon period, a president uh, even today tends to enjoy, was, was no longer the case. Um, uh, the, his, his 
his secretary, treasury secretary, Alexander Hamilton's policies, uh, which involved the creation of a national bank and um, a, a taxation policy that included a tax on whiskey, which was not popular in the South, were highly controversial. And so Washington, um, uh, uh, even before he left for the South, word reached him that, for example, Wiley Jones, a former uh, a governor of North Carolina, had let it be known that he would always revere General Washington, but he would not allow President Washington into his house. He was going to have to do a selling job. This was not going to be, you know, one um, uh, 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 ovation after another. And so off he set on the New England tour. And, um, and so when I heard about all this, I was thinking, wow, um, you know, Washington went on this road trip, and I'm getting itchy here in my office on Nantucket. What if I followed George Washington? Uh, what if I, 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 I um, retraced his steps? And one of my favorite books of all time is John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie in which Steinbeck, 25 years after writing uh, Grapes of Wrath, uh, when he toured the Western parts of the country in a bakery truck, um, uh, you know, uh, experiencing and talking to the people that would inspire um, that great classic, he realized that uh, he had lost touch with the country of his birth. He needed to go out there and see it. So he got in a Ford pickup truck with his, his uh a standard poodle Charlie, and went in search of the meaning of America. And I thought, well, what if I did uh, my Steinbeck impression and uh, brought along my wife, Melissa, who was newly retired, and our dog, Dora, uh, not a standard poodle, uh, but a young Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever, a very high energy dog. What if um, we set out uh, and followed George Washington's travels. Uh, perhaps it would provide an interesting historical perspective on you know, our own unprecedented times and political division by exploring and doing our best to discover what Washington experienced as he tried to unite this country at the beginning, very beginning of our history. And so Travels with George really tells two stories, the story of Washington's journey across this country and the story of Melissa, Dora, and, and, and our, our journey across the country. And uh, it was uh, a, an immensely interesting book to write and to uh, research and to experience. And, uh, it's, it, and it's, it's just been such fun to um, uh, share this book with readers. And I'm looking forward to uh, hearing some of your questions and discussing the book further. All right. Well, thank you. Um, that's a great overview. And um, so now we get into uh, the, the question and answer portion of our interview. And these questions are submitted by uh, the compatriot members of the SAR. Um, so the first uh, question we have is from Michael Martin of the Alabama Society. And Michael's question states, uh, George Washington's life was framed by fork in the road type decisions. He had to grapple with being a loyalist versus a patriot, a federalist versus an anti-federalist, ideals of freedom versus slavery, et cetera. George Washington's leadership, however, helped bring a deeply divided country together despite our regional differences. How do you think George Washington would help bring our country together today, given our present polarization on many issues? especially with the present day challenges of media and political parties that seemingly thrive on discourse? Yeah, oh, that is a very good question. And, uh, you know, and one that preoccupied um, me throughout our travels. Uh, you know, I think one of the things Washington was trying to unite this country and he, he succeeded in large part. He created, um, uh, he established a, a national government uh, that that was built to last. I mean, we're still, uh, you know, how many presidents later uh, following uh, George Washington's lead? And yet the fact of the matter is not even George Washington was able to, to stop uh, the pernicious spread of partisanship. Um, and, you know, it was even in his own cabinet 
I, I spoke briefly about Alexander Hamilton, his his secretary of the treasury and his um, his economic policies, which were largely based on the British model. Um, uh, uh, because, you know, remember, they were trying to do something very difficult. This was a country that had rebelled against the most powerful military power on earth over the issue of taxation. How the heck was Washington going to establish a country that taxed this group of people? And, um, you know, this is not an easy thing to, to take on. And so, uh, Hamilton and Washington, who agreed with Hamilton's policies, looked to the British model. And Washington, after eight years of war, had realized that, you know, what it will, if we get defeated in this conflict, it will not be the British army that's defeating us. It will be the British financial system that is able to support um, this extraordinary war effort 3,000 miles from the British uh, homeland. I mean, you know, it, Few other countries in the world could have done this without the financial um, uh, situation that, that had been created in England. And so uh, Hamilton, quite rightly, looked to the British model. Um, uh, and now within Washington's cabinet, when it was none other than Thomas Jefferson, who um, uh, came from a very different point of view. He uh, had spent uh, several years as uh, our ambassador, uh, our, our French foreign minister, and uh, look to France uh, and the, the revolutionary fervor of France as more appropriate uh, to America. And um, and and he he also was was uh, uh, deeply, I think, jealous of Hamilton, whose uh, Treasury Department out, you know, completely outnumbered Jefferson State Department, and you know, and they just did not agree on anything. Um, and initially, they were able to put those differences aside and come to some important compromises that got us going at the beginning. But as the years uh, went along, open warfare broke out between the two of them. And uh, by Washington's second term, it was as bad, believe me, as it is today. Um, it was it was personal. It was ugly. Um, the the election of 1800, just after Washington's death, would be uh, in which uh, Jefferson would emerge, would just be brutal. So if Washington came back today, I don't think he would say, you know, be necessarily surprised at our par partisan divide. I think what would um, uh, concern him are our uh, efforts to undercut the people's faith in government. Uh, in a in a nation of laws, he spent eight years of his life. Um, you know, so the first two on the road in, in many instances, trying to create a sense of the legitimacy of our federal government. And I think um, you know, as soon as uh, you know, he believed this was a nation not of of you know, this was a nation of laws. You know, he was trying to use his great personal popularity to create an office that would ultimately transcend the ego of any one person. You know, he wasn't doing it so that he could be the, the national leader for the rest of his life. He didn't, that was not his goal. He did not want to be president. He was our most you know, reluctant president ever. What he wanted to create was something that would outlast him because no one in America in the beginning could have bridged what was already a partisan divide and create something uh, built for the long term. And so I think Washington, if you were here today, he would not be surprised by it. His instincts were to reach across the aisle. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, uh, Rhode Island uh, had um, uh, not uh, participated in Washington's election and only belatedly uh, be joined the union. What does Washington do? I think uh, political pundits today would have classed them as enemy territory. Don't waste your time going to ro prodigal Rhode Island. That was the opposite of Washington's impulse. He got on a schooner, sailed from New York uh, to, to uh, Newport and Providence and succeeded in turning the biggest doubters when it came to the legitimacy of the federal government he was creating into some of his biggest fans. Um, you know, he really saw the importance of reaching out across the, the emerging political divide. But all in the end, not even Washington was able.
to stem the tide of partisanship. It, it kind of goes with a country created in a revolution uh, and, and is, is you know, a part of uh, the, the hopefully controlled chaos that leads, that is part of a democracy. Um, second question is from um, Cliff Olson of the Missouri Society. And he asked, what were Washington's objectives and top priorities for the tour? Ah, what were his objectives? Well, it's interesting. Not even a month into his presidency, he sends a letter to John Adams, a version of which would, would be distributed uh, among his cabinet, saying, would it be a smart idea for me to um, uh, get out of the presidential office and, and talk to people and learn about it, the, the people it is my job to lead? He saw immediately that um, uh, there was a real danger of becoming isolated uh, uh, as president. And his, you know, his objectives were to see as many people as possible, um, but do it as efficiently as possible. And so, um, which is a tall order. Now, George Washington was a highly functioning individual. I mean, this was a man who was up uh, often 4 a.m., uh, you know, uh, and, and went to sleep uh, you know, at darkness. And it was said he often got more work done before breakfast than most people completed in a day. And so he approached uh, this you know, this uh, a road trip, you know, as, as a way to be, to, to see as many people, to influence as many people, and to show as many people as possible that there was something more than their town, their village, their state, there was the United States of America. So when it came to the, um, you know, the, the New England tour, he realized he did not want to go to Rhode Island, which not, had not yet ratified the Constitution. And he, um, so he, he mapped his tour to avoid that uh, Rhode Island. You know, he did not go up the equivalent of 95, I-95. I he, uh, at, New, at, at New Haven, he, he headed to Hartford uh, and then up to Springfield and then on uh, uh, to Worcester and then uh, uh, Boston and thus avoiding Rhode Island. He was actively trying to put pressure on, on, on Rhode Island. You know, so the, the other thing he was trying to do was yeah, he was listening to people. He was a farmer. He would often stop his carriage and talk to uh, farmers working the fields about, you know, what was happening with their crops. But when it came to his New England tour, he had, uh, uh, Massachusetts had already emerged as the, one of the tech capitals of the United States. Uh, Washington realized if we were going to break our dependence on Great Britain, uh, we needed to ha undergo an, uh, a version of what would be called the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we, uh, uh, the, it was British uh, textiles, whether they were woolen or cotton, uh, or something that Americans depended upon. We didn't have the technology, the mills that were creating these products. Um, and it was illegal um, uh, from uh, in Britain to leave the country with any kind of diagram or description of this very high tech of its day. And so Washington, uh, during his New England tour, went to several kind of embryonic manufactories. We call them factories now, but manufactories they were known as, as then, and, um, and made active attempts to encourage what he saw as the future. And so uh, his, his stops along the way were engineered to, to you know, cast a spotlight, if you will, on the importance of this emerging technology. And for a Southerner, this was, you know, this was very unusual. Thomas Jefferson had famously said in his notes on the state of Virginia that the factories of Europe had no place in America where it was the ideal of the farmer uh, that was what made a good a citizen in a republic. Of course, left out of that statement was the Southern farmers' uh, reliance on slavery. Um, and, but Washington saw a different kind of future, as did, as did Hamilton. And so that determined a lot of where he went. Uh, when he went to the Southern tour, he had to hit uh, Savannah and, and uh, Charleston, the centers of, of the the rice economy. Remember, cotton had not yet emerged. Uh, it would uh, in just a few years time. 
after Washington's visit with Eli Whitney, one of those Yankees, uh, you know, those inventors who would um, uh, create, uh, along with the help of Nathaniel Green's widow, Katie Green, uh, a new version of the cotton gin that would revolutionize, um, you know, uh, the cotton, the, the, you know, the, that whole aspect of the Southern agriculture, but that was still in the future. And so uh, Washington's Southern tour uh, uh, was, was, you know, it made no sense to go by horse-drawn carriage if you're going to Savannah and Charleston. You should have gotten in a, in a, in a, uh, a boat and sailed down, but Washington wanted to see the people. And then he made, I think, um, a fairly courageous decision to head inland because it was in, in inland Georgia and the Carolinas where there was real opposition to the ta tax on whiskey. And so, um, you know, one of the towns in South Carolina had already issued an edict uh, declaring that tax, um, you know, uh, you know, unpatriotic and, and unfair. But Washington, you know, ventured into the, the lion's maw, if you will, and did his best to convince people. And while there would be um, a whiskey rebellion uh, in Western Pennsylvania, by the way, a part of Pennsylvania Washington never went to during his tour, there would no, be no similar uh, uprising in the South. And I think you can attribute that to what I call in the book, the Washington effect, um, uh, that you know, he really had an impact on people as he tried to explain what they were trying to accomplish. That, you know, the, his policies could not make everyone happy, but he was trying to make as ma uh, many people throughout the country as happy as possible. And it was a new concept uh, for, uh, for, for people. Uh, in, in these 13 former colonies. And so, you know, he really worked at it um, to, to make these as efficient and, and, but, you know, given our um, current technology, it's nuts to think, you know, here he was in a carriage traveling 40 miles a day on a good time, having to stop several times to feed both the horses and the people. Um, but this was the technology of the day and Washington exploited it, exploited it to best effect. But I think the, um, his support for industrialization and innovation, uh, particularly in the Northern colonies, was also in support of his foreign policy of neutrality. The, the sooner we could become independent of English, uh, French, and Spanish um, imports, the easier it would be to, for us to maintain that neutrality. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and I think he, he began to understand the importance of this in a way that I don't think there really was anyone in the country who, who got it the way Washington, and, and that was one of Washington's great gifts. You know, he was not the greatest thinker of his day, but he w had the ability to recognize the most important thing to focus on, you know, uh, to dial out the static of life and to focus on what was important. And during the revolution, it was, to obviously win the revolution. Uh, and, and that involved working with the French in an alliance. And it was while working with the French, which was no cakewalk, believe me, um, you know, just as uh, Montgomery and Eisenhower did not always see eye to eye during World War II, uh, Washington and Rochambeau uh, were <laughs> hard, you know, it really helped that Yorktown went so well. <laughs> <laughs> that they, you know, would look mm -hmm. back uh, in, in kind of rose-colored glasses when you uh, actually experience what they're, how they're getting along in the beginning. And he realized how dangerous it was. You know, any, you know, a country, um, whether it was France, whether it was Spain, whether it was uh, Britain, you know, they were all lurking out there uh, with possessions of their own, looking for any kind of frailty. Uh, in this new union of states that it would allow them to move in and and get a, a you know a new foothold in North America and so you're right he dependence um, you know he wanted to we needed to be as independent economically and technologically as possible uh, which was you know um, not necessarily some uh, southern farmers saw as a priority. All right, very good. Um, our next question from Mark Anthony of the Georgia Society. Uh, as the first vice president and second president of the United States, why do you think John Adams did not follow Washington's example and 
make a tour of his own? Yeah, no, that, that, that is a good question. Well, you know, Was Washington and John Adams were very different people, uh, you know, just personality wise. I mean, I think uh, uh, the, the answer to that question lies uh, in a way in what happened during the New England tour. Since Washington was going on a tour of New England, he thought it appropriate to invite his vice president to come along with him since he was a New Englander. Now, Washington was someone, uh, you know, who had the ability to, you know, engage in, the, in public discourse, who enjoyed getting out of the office and, and seeing people, you know, and traveling. Not John Adams, not, he was, you know, Adams was a politician, uh, but he was also kind of a social recluse, um, uh, as he would say it, you know, at some, one point in a letter to a friend, you know, I am a surly politician, you know, I'd much rather be back home with a few friends than go out and glad hand uh, with others. And so John Adams said, no, I don't want to go on the New England tour with you. I think it's significant that um, uh, the, the vice presidency would be, uh, uh, as Adams would complain, one of the most insignificant uh, 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 positions to hold. I think it has a large part to do with uh, Adams' refusal to accompany Washington. When Adams became president, he was either in the White House or back home in Braintree. He had absolutely no interest in, in getting out there and, and seeing people and in, in attending all of those uh, 18th century equivalents of you know, rubber chicken dinners <laughs> as, he, as he, you know, he met people and spread the word. That was not his style. Same with Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson had no interest in getting on the road and pressing the flesh, nor did James Madison, who was more of a recluse, if anything, than, than them. It, you know, it would ultimately only, uh, not until the other side of the War of 1812, uh, when you have James Monroe just become president, the, the Federalist Party has imploded so that um, it's really just uh, the Republicans, the, you know, the, the party of, of Jefferson and um, Monroe, who is one of the most partisan people during Washington's lifetime. Washington despised the man by the time he died. Um, what does Je uh, Monroe do? He, he declares uh, a president should be the leader of a country, not a party. <laughs> and he goes on a tour of the country. And what does he do? He, he served briefly in the Continental Army. He dresses in a, a military uniform, doing his best George Washington imitation. And so, um, uh, it, you know, it took a different kind. I think it comes down to a combination of personality and political goals. And, um, and so Washington uh, did it when he had that honeymoon period went out and saw the thing Monroe had it when he had a, a period of, of, you know, without the political divide that had typified American politics up until then. And so I think those are our conditions that um, um, make a, this kind of tour um, uh, propitious. Our next question, Bruce Flanders of the Kansas Society. Bruce says, uh, ask, or states, uh, the Sons of the American Revolution often reference the injunctions of George Washington in his farewell address to the American people. Did you see any influences uh, from his travels in the address? Mm, that's a good question. And what, you know, the address is in many ways, I think, our, our political Bible in a way in terms of what the roadmap uh, uh, Washington lays out with considerable help from Alexander Hamilton, who ghost wrote the speech. Um, you know, it's a roadmap of, of what the future and the perils of the potential future held. And yeah, I think it's informed by, you know, Washington, by the time he finished um, his, his last tour, the Southern tour, had visited all 13 states. He knew more than anyone, you know, what this country was about. I mean, it would talk about a thorough political education and a geographic education and a cultural education. And, um, and so I think this point of view informs um, that speech. You know, from Wa Washington's point of view, uh, it's all about the union. You know, that's what this, the speech is about. That, um, 
you know, it's not about your state, your your own sense of what's right and wrong. It's about all of us together. And um, and this is a concept that he had been on the road selling for two years early on in his presidency. And I think when it comes to his farewell address, that is a statement uh, that contains all of the wisdom and experience of the, his eight years as president, but really distilled in a, um, in, in a way in which only firsthand experience can provide. I mean, that's the thing about Washington. You know, Thomas Jefferson and Hamilton were brilliant. Um, you know, and they thought in many ways in terms of abstractions, you know, in terms of dogmas. Washington was different. He, he was out to make things work. I mean, he wasn't so concerned about being, justifying his beliefs. He was just honestly trying to make a republic, uh, a, a, you know, a, 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 a nation of laws work. And, um, and, and the farewell address, I think is, you know, a tremendous testament to um, that ethic of, you know, trying to not get caught up in any kind of dogmatic, you know, this my way or the highway, but to see the wisdom of compromise, to see that there is always another side to the story and to try to do what is best, not for you, but for the country. And I think that's, that's a point that is lost in a lot of our modern politicians. Next question also from George Thurman. Um, says, beyond George Washington's myths and outright falsehoods that were promulgated by Augusta George's own Parson Weems in his series of children's books and the April Fool's story of Cornwallis, Washington's Greyhound, what was the most outlandish Washington myth you discovered on your, your travels? Well, I, I think those are two pretty good. I mean, um, uh, those are two great, pretty outlandish myths. I mean, I have to say, um, just before I go into any others, the the myth of Cornwallis the dog was one. You know, it's it's a it's a, a tradition that has made its way into a lot of mainstream histories of Washington. The, this myth that there was a greyhound named Cornwallis. Uh, if, of course, for his great Washington's great foe during the Revolution, that followed the entourage uh, through the South and finally expired, uh, presumably from exhaustion, uh, in, in Augusta, where it was buried, only to have the the sarcophagus or whatever uh, discovered during road construction. Uh, but as I would discover during our own visit. Um, to, to Augusta, in which Bill Kirby, a wonderful uh, writer for the Augusta Chronicle, pointed out that the, you know, the only basis we have for uh, Cornwallis is this one story in the Augusta Chronicle, uh, written on April Fool's Day, <laughs> describing a discovery that no one has seen since, <laughs> uh, where the construction was happening in a part of Augusta that Washington never visited uh, during his tour. And so, yes, this is this is how you have to be careful with traditions. Um, you know, some of them are outright falsehoods. Some of them, are, you know, traditions tend to reflect all oral traditions. Uh, usually, have the basis of fact in initially inspiring them, but then uh, they change over time as as uh, the circumstances um, of the future change the point of view. You know, many of the myths around Washington's journey were recorded in uh, local histories published in the late 19th century at a time that was very different from the late 18th century. And so you have to be careful. I think uh, the one I, I think um, uh, the, the falsehood I, I found most, I won't say amusing, but um, is that the, the myth of the Washington elm tree in New England. Let me tell you, it seemed like every New England town Washington visited had uh, what was known as the Washington Elm. And this was a great leafy tree, a beautiful tree on the outskirts of this town where Washington would pause to wipe his fevered brow, uh, refresh himself with a drink, and then gaze upon the beauty of that town before him. And has one um, ironic, uh, commentator would say, if Washington stopped 
at every one of the Washington Elms uh, uh, he is supposed to have, he never would have made it out of New England. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is he was traveling in October and November when the leaves were off the trees, it was cold uh, he, and he was had a schedule. You know, uh, earlier I referred to the efficiency with uh, which he uh, tackled uh, these road trips. He was not pausing at these trees. The other thing that sort of is the nail in the coffin when it comes to these traditions is that what was a big leafy tree in the late 19th century when these traditions were recorded for the first time, uh, that tree was, if it existed, was a mere sp spindly sapling uh, that Washington would have hardly noticed as he roared past in a cloud of dust. And so um, for my money, I, that, that is the tradition that I, I enjoy, you know, that I, f I find one of the good whoppers uh, uh, that, um, you know, each town clings to so, so um, nostalgically, but reflects probably nothing that ever happened in the past. All righty. Well, this is a, a semi-related follow-up um, from Bobby Hulse of the Kansas Society. Uh, what influence did Gen General Washington have on the minds of the young people that he met uh, during his travels? Oh, he had a huge impact on the young people. And this is, this is where I, I think you can uh, have a little more faith in, in, in tradition. I mean, what is striking uh, is how many people who saw Washington as kids, as he made his way across the country, would record their memories. I mean, one of my favorites is a, a girl named Sarah uh, in uh, Oyster Bay, New York on Long Island, who was standing at the gate to her house. She was eight years old. I mean, just a kid. And across the way, uh, some workmen were building what would become a one-room schoolhouse uh, that would be there for more than a hundred years, the Bungtown School. So this is really Cold Spring, where Cold Spring Harbor meets uh, Oyster Bay right there. And she was standing there when none other than George Washington <laughs> rides by in a horse. And she watches as Washington gets off his horse. Now remember, Washington was a tall man, six foot two, six foot four inches tall. He goes over and he helps the men who are putting a rafter up in the roof. You know, and he helps them raise it and then uh, leads them in three cheers and offers each man a tip afterwards. And, you know, this is not the Washington on the $1 bill. You know, this is Washington having a good time on the road. And, you know, this is Washington, the traveler, the human being. And um, there would be other uh, accounts of, of kids who would um, see Washington and be, you know, and had heard all about him, of course, before his trip. This was the man who won the American Revolution. You know, this was a man tantamount to a walking god. And then they would see him and, and realize that he was, and this is the phrase that is repeated, just a man over and over again, that is recorded. And what's interesting, you know, it sounds kind of like gobbledygook, you know, oh, this is uh, a little too schmaltzy, but these, these traditions get repeated. And these were not stories that were in uh, the, the papers of the day. You know, these were stories that get repeated over, there are different versions of it, but they're, they, you see them in New England, you see them in the South. I think Washington, you know, in a very classical tradition, was saying, yes, I am your a general, I am your president, but I am a citizen. I am just a man like you. This was just the point Washington was trying to deliver. And so, uh, uh, you know, but once again, can you imagine the impression this is making on children? And so over and over again, you see, um, uh, uh, you know, the impression he made on kids. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and he, he really enjoyed kids. Uh, and, and uh, there's the story of a girl in Shrewsbury, who um, Washington uh, steps in, in Shrewsbury, he was wearing not his general's outfit, but a gray suit, a very sort of, um, he toned down the wow factor. And um, he steps out of the carriage uh, in Shrewsbury to say hello to the children that lined either side of the road. And, uh, you know, the enslaved servants that are part of his retinue are, are dressed in uh, uh, this, this 
gold lace finery and Washington steps out and he's dressed in this very humble uh, brown suit and this little girl who, you know, is expecting all of this says, you know, my goodness, he is only a man and turns around and stamps off. And Washington thought this was highly amusing. Uh, and according to tradition, you know, gives her a dollar, a dollar that would be um, uh, uh, preserved in the family for years. And so, you know, Washington, and remember, just to close my answer to this question, remember Washington and Martha had adopted uh, the children of Martha's deceased son, uh, Washi, who was eight, and Nellie, who was were ten in the presidential household, you know, uh, uh, you know they had they they were the gr grandparents of these kids, but they had they had legally adopted them. They had a young family. Washington greatly enjoyed young children, and um, and so um, the the kid side of of the, his tour is is something I I, I found um, immensely appealing, and I think speaks to the fact that Washington was more than the statue. So many of us uh, attribute him to have been. He was someone that um, you know had had you know had, had a softer side. All right, a semi-related question. Uh, from Shane James of the International Society. What was the most interesting Washington blanked here discovery you made on your travels? Washington blanked here? Mm -hmm. Yes. You always see the signs, you know, Washington slept here or Washington did Absolutely. this or that. Well, I mean, and that, you know, a side, side note, uh, by the end of our the year and a half in which we were following George, Melissa and I got really tired of that whole historical joke. Ah ha ha! Washington slept here, you know, as if he was somehow, you know, sleeping around or something like that. No, the guy was working tremendously hard each night in a tavern. Uh, represented another night on the road away from Martha and the kids. Um, eating bad food, sleeping on terrible beds uh, as he was trying to unite this country. And so, come on, man, it's not a joke. You know, it's a, it's a, mo these are monuments to the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the energy and the, the diligence Washington brought to the office of the presidency. One of the uh, Washington blanked here I enjoy um, was uh, in Newburyport, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, the house Washington stayed in uh, was this great brick mansion. But in the 19th century, this great uh, brick edifice became uh, the, the, the town's li public library, and it still is today. And, um, and so, and in many ways, this is a book uh, that is a love letter to librarians everywhere. Uh, before we even departed, uh, my mother-in-law was a librarian. Um, uh, my great-grandfather was a librarian. And before we departed on the, our own tour, I sent out, I, I reached out to the librarians and libraries and historical societies of as many of the towns Washington visited as possible. And these people were tremendously helpful in providing me with all sorts of information. And in many instances, volunteered to, to hop in our car and show us around. And so, um, um, you know, librarians uh, and, and historical society volunteers are, you know, what makes history remain alive in this country. And I was being given a tour of the Newburyport Library uh, by the head librarian. And, and, um, and we, <laughs> we were in the, the periodical section. And, uh, and she said, you know, who knows? Washington could have slept here. And I thought, ah, oh, this is perfect. Washington slept here in the periodical section. I mean, that, that for me was, was kind of a thematic uh, uh, a combination of events. I mean, one of the places that was, was really uh, uh, fascinating for us were, were in two instances, we were shown the actual beds Washington slept in. And one of them was in Virginia uh, 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 with the, the uh, Walter and Alice Cole's house where, you know, they have the bed that Walter's uh, ancestor, uh, you know, uh, uh, in which Washington slept. And in recent years, um, 
uh, it was in recent decades, it's been discovered that the Coles family farm is on, um, on this huge mother load of uh, uranium. And they have been trying to, to mine that uranium, which brings up a whole issue of state. You know, they have been unsuccessful so far, but it's, you know, uh, this was an instance where we saw the bed Washington slept in, in the context of, you know, the Coles uh, dealing with issues of state rights versus private property rights. This seemed like a, a, a vortex of history uh, that had been set off uh, by Washington's bed. I, you know, one of my favorite TV shows is Doctor Who, you know, in which uh, mm -hmm. the TARDIS, the, 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 the English phone booth comes down. And in this instance, uh, Washington's bed seemed like that time machine uh, that was taking us all, all for a ride. All right, so our next question um, comes from uh, the education outreach staff uh, and myself, but it, it's something that we have to talk about. It's the elephant in the room when it comes to our early American history is and always has been a dichotomy between the founding of a nation based on freedom from tyranny and the inalienable rights of men uh, to the pursuit of happiness and the and the unconscionable practice of slavery. So you, you address that slavery was more universal than just a Southern thing, that the founders were aware of the existing disconnects, that uncomfortable compromises had to be made to ensure the nation survived its infancy and the contradictions and how Americans have dealt with it over the intervening years. How have your views evolved about those men over time and how should historians and the public consider them today? Oh, I think this is the, the, in many ways, the question that was central uh, to my concerns in writing this book. Um, uh, because, why, yes, Washington was the only founding father to free his enslaved workers, um, you know, only, uh, uh, you know, which is remarkable. But, you know, you can't give him a pass on the issue by any means. Um, you know, one of the things, remember, Washington became a slaveholder at the age of le of age of 11 when his father died and he inherited several enslaved um, workers. I mean, you know, this was Washington's introduction uh, to the, this institution, but the revolution changed him. You know, his friendship with Lafayette, the young idealistic French officer who would later say, I never would have lifted my sword in the cause of American liberty if I had known, but thereby I was creating a nation of slavery. Uh, Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson would record the, that the comment made by Washington, if slavery should ever divide this country, I will go with the northern part. Extraordinary statement coming from a Virginian. Washington uh, did something that most of us are unable to do, to move beyond the assumptions of our upbringing, to recognize that there, you know, there were some things wrong about how we grew up uh, and, and, and to realize that a change had to happen, uh, that Washington did not um, wholly move past those assumptions, um, I don't think condemns him. You know, is, it means that we uh, turn our backs on all he tried to do to create a nation. I mean, Washington, Washington was someone who traveled a great distance, not only on the road, but as a human being. Um, you know, he had, there were 300 enslaved workers at Mount Vernon. Uh, he owned roughly half of them. The other half were owned by the estate of Martha's dead husband uh, and Washington uh, that were going to uh, the heirs, uh, mainly being the grandchildren that, uh, that Martha and Washington were, were or caretaking. And so Washington had to, you know, it was, and so this made it very difficult. The two groups intermarried and by freeing his, his enslaved workers, it would create all sorts of issues um, uh, on Mount Vernon. Uh, but Washington was, was um, committed to freeing his own enslaved workers. And yet um, in the last year of his life, when he's drafting that will uh, that will accomplish that, he is actively pursuing pursuing Ona Judge, an enslaved house servant of Martha's that had escaped to freedom in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. 
you know, how to reconcile that. Well, Washington was like, I think all human beings. Um, uh, there are, we are all paradoxical. We all know the right path, but that doesn't necessarily mean we always make the right decisions. Um, this is the human condition. The fact of the matter is Washington's uh, uh, sole focus was on the concept of the union. If the union was going to happen, compromises had to be made in the beginning. But remember, 17, 75 years after his inauguration, it would be the union that would lead Abraham Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And so uh, when it comes to Washington, we, he does not get a free pass. And I think, you know, um, uh, but I think, I, I also think it's important uh, that we, we, we recognize that without him, we really would not have a country. And so it's, it's you know, he, he, that, I think that's why he's such a central person. He more than anyone embodies the conflicted nature of America, a place that aspires for freedom for all, and yet was a, a land of slavery at its very beginning. And Washington, as much as anyone in this country was grappling in the, that vortex of, of two irreconcilable ideas that are uh, the tortured soul of America. Reflecting on your research and writings and the deeper knowledge of his life, how do you see future generations viewing Washington? And this is from Mickey McGuire of the Michigan Society. Yeah, well, the, uh, the future legacy of Washington, I think um, uh, is, is one that, you know, we cannot, predict the future. Um, as Washington said, if people could do that, <laughs> they, you know, we would have a very different life. But I think, you know, I mean, the, what I was trying to, to get at with this book was that Washington's legacy is complex, um, sometimes frustrating and infuriating, um, just as it is when it comes to the legacy of this land. But it is, he is indispensable when it comes to the, the, who we are as a nation. You know, you can, um, you, you can look back at the past and find fault uh, with people. But believe me, in a hundred years time, when people look back on us, they will find plenty of faults with us. Um, this is the nature of, of living in the present. You, you know, you're too overwhelmed by the competing demands of life. You know, some of them self-centered, some of them altruistic, but uh, never fulfilling, er knowing quite how to fulfill, you know, do the best thing by all people. And, and so we're all in a fog of the present as we live. And, um, and the judgment of the future will be harsh in one way or another. And yet there's some, the example of Washington is someone who, who was trying to build something that would transcend his own time. I mean, that, that's as, as tall an order as anyone can take on. As I say in the book, to be haunted by the past is bad enough, to, but to uh, be the first is to feel the, uh, the full, potentially unbearable weight of the future. And that's what Washington took on. And I think we should be forever grateful that he was the one that America looked to at the very beginning of our nation's founding. All right, Nat, I'd like to thank you very much for, uh, for taking the time to be with us today and for, for the tremendous insights. I re really enjoyed chatting with you and, uh, and getting some more insider looks at your book. Uh, I hope um, members of the Sons of the American Revolution are gonna go out there and uh, pick up their copies and uh, uh, they can find uh, more information there on the website um, and uh, available probably in your local bookstores. Well, well, we we well, thank you, Brooks. It's really been fun to, to talk with you. And the, those, those were great questions. And, um, and you know, uh, your organization is one in which, the, you know, the, the past is, is kept alive in a very vital way. And um, so it is, I, I really enjoy this opportunity to speak with you and, um, and, and share the thoughts of, uh, related to Travels with George with your membership.